Understanding Cisco Certification. I am so excited for you. <laughs> I know that's a very unusual way to start the nugget, but I am. I've been pacing this room for the last 10 minutes trying to set my mind back into what it was like when I didn't know about certification and I literally fell into a certification program and it was like, wow, a whole new magical world was open to me. And now I have that opportunity to do that for you. So what my goal is, is to show you the Cisco certification program in all its glory, give you my best recommendations I can on what path you should go, and then answer as many questions as possible. So that way you can feel settled as you move ahead on this journey, and it is one. The Cisco certification program is multiple areas of expertise with varied focus. I'm gonna come back to this slide in just a moment, but this represents all the different paths that you could take in the Cisco certification world. Most people get started with routing and switching, so they get their CCENT certification and then progress along what I would call the pyramid of Cisco certification. And that's this guy right here, which dictates how deep into that focus area you want to go. So if you wanna know how do I get started with Cisco certification, first off, pick your area of focus. And I would highly suggest routing and switching if you're not too sure where to start because routing and switching applies to just about every certification track that Cisco has. Then start down here at the entry level, which for the routing and switching path happens to be IC and D1. That's the first exam that you'll take. And when you pass that, you get the CCENT, that's the Cisco Certified Entry Level Network Technician Certification that you have achieved. Go on and pass ICND2, and now you have the Cisco Certified Network Associate. You've achieved the Associate Level Certification. Now pass three more exams, like I said, one or more exams for each one of these levels. That would be Route, Switch, and T-Shoot. And you've achieved the Cisco certified network professional certification each one of these putting you into a new class of network engineer each one of them opening new doors of employment each one of them opening new opportunities of tasks you can perform concepts you understand superpowers that you have right so the speed at which you move up this pyramid is totally and 100 percent dependent on you and how much money you have, right? Each one of these exams that you take costs anywhere from $100 all the way up to $1,500, right? If you're up here at the expert and architect level and travel, you actually have to travel out to Cisco's headquarters and take that proctored exam in their environment. I can explain more on that later. So it behooves you to be ready before you go take one of those exams or else you just start wasting money. Now, each one of these exams has a three-year shelf life. So you pass ICND-1, you now have that exam and the CCENT certification that lasts for three years. Now, when that three years comes to expiration, you have three options you could choose. One, you could just let it expire and you lose the certification, you have to start over. Two, you can retake the exam you already took, retake ICND-1, and you are granted another three years if you pass the certification exam of having the CCENT certification. Or what I would highly suggest is move on, right? Cisco encourages certification growth. So as soon as you pass the ICND-2 exam, you automatically get this one and the CCNA certification for th three years, and you automatically renew your lower level exams for three years as well. If you move up and take the CCNP exams and just pass one of them, remember I said there's three of them, it's actually route, switch, and T-shoot. You just pass the route exam, Cisco sees that as you continuing your certification. And so they automatically, when you pass that one exam, renew all lower level certifications for three years. That's awesome because you don't have to spend your time retaking stuff you already know. You can continue to grow your knowledge into the switch, into the T-shoot. And as soon as you pass those three exams, now you've got the CCNP, three years, three years, three years are assigned to each one of those. Now, it's not cumulative. It's like not like you're adding time, right? You get a three-year refresh and everything starts ticking down from there. You can't add up your three-year intervals to get nine years of certification. So let's flip back to these areas of focus because these really represent your career paths in the Cisco certification world. Normal human beings will specialize in one, maybe two, maybe three of these areas. Like maybe you start off in routing and switching and you get maybe a professional level certification in that. And as you're going there, you're like, ooh, I really liked wireless. I'm curious about that. And so maybe you decide to get an associate level in wireless so you can kind of dabble in it. But man, security really piqued your interest while you were doing that. And so you're like, man, I, I wanna go all the way. So 
to achieve expert level in security. And that's usually where you'll stay. That's, that's aligning with your career. And that's what you do when you keep those certifications up to date. Occasionally, you'll find people that are like, oh, I'm a, I'm a 5X CCIE and all these different areas. But those, those people are usually people like me, where they're uh, paid educators or paid consultants, where their whole job is just to learn information and disseminate it to others. So that's not normal to see that kind of level of expertise. But one thing is guaranteed. Change is inevitable. There's a matrix quote, change is inevitable, Mr. Anderson. For example, they used to have CCNP voice, which you don't see here in this list anymore because about three years ago, CCNP voice went away and was replaced by CCNP collaboration because now voice and video became that. And so Cisco provides a migration path to say, okay, take this one exam and you migrate your skills or these two exams, and you migrate your skills from CCNP voice into CCNP collaboration and you achieve that level of certification as well. Now, just in having this conversation with you on the areas of focus, I've inadvertently outlined the top four certification programs that Cisco has just because of their broad appeal to network environments. Everybody needs routing and switching, right? Everybody needs wireless and security, and most people need voice and video collaboration on their network environment. So if you're looking for job appeal, those are the tracks that you want to go on. You also notice that right here, four of the certification tracks, these four right here, begin with the same exam. So ICND1 is the exam that gets you started on all four of these, and then you take a specialized CCNA for each one. So CCNA routing and switching builds on the original ICND1. CCNA security builds on the original ICND1. So one common exam, one unique exam to get your associate level certification for those four paths. Now, I'm not saying these other certification tracks aren't important. It's just they're a little more specialized. Not everybody works for a service provider. Not everybody lives in an industrial environment. So typically, those who work or are wanting to work in those environments will follow those certification programs. All right, I want to spend the rest of our time together answering questions about certification, the most common questions that I've gotten over the years. And the number one question that I always get, and deserving of its own slide, goes something like this. Jeremy, which is better, a college degree or certification? <laughs> it's such a divisive question. And framing it that way, I can't answer it simply without offending a massive amount of people. So I am opinionated on this issue. And I want to preface it with, this is Jeremy's opinion. And what I've seen in my own life and the lives of thousands of people that I've taught over the years. I'll start off by saying education itself has value. It doesn't matter how it comes to you. It has value, whether it's through a college degree or a certification program. But what I've seen in my own life and the lives of thousands of people that I've taught over the years of education is that college itself has a general studies feel about it. It's even though you have a specialty in your degree program, like mine was computer science, right? I learned microeconomics. I learned language. I learned arts. I learned how to work in Excel, a lot of the general studies. And at my stage in life that I was in college, right, coming right out of high school because that's what you're supposed to do. I was bored out of my mind. <laughs> I'll tell you, frankly, because I had no relevance for the information that I was receiving. I learned computer programming and quickly flushed it out of my mind once I finished with college because I didn't use it. I didn't need it. I didn't even like it, right? So you get general studies, you get some specialization, but the beauty is this is a door opener forever, right? You have the college degree and there's some organizations, particularly in government, that you just can't get past that ceiling without having a college degree. So that being said, IT is very different. Certifications can quickly get you into real world relevant stuff that applies directly to modern jobs because this has the luxury of being constantly updated all the time and that's how they design the program, right? I just explained that it expires every three years so it's targeted, it's direct on exactly what people are needing now versus college degrees where I was learning programming for languages that when I got out, I found out hadn't even been used in the world for years. As a matter of fact, when I got out of college, I was so jaded from the experience, I thought computers must not be for me and I went to work for Pizza Hut. Someday I'll have to tell you the whole story, but through a long chain of God-directed events, I ended up in a certification class that I had never signed up for, didn't even know existed, and was way over my head, but blew me away with the immediate and direct application to life that it provided. 
And over the years, I have found myself being just one example of hundreds of people that I see every day who are amazing people and have amazing talents, but are stuck doing jobs way beneath what they could be because they believe the only way to get out of there is to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars and years of their life going after a completely irrelevant college degree. And I say that with as much love as I can for all of us college degreed folk out there as I can. You wonder why I get so excited about certification is because over my 20 years of training, I have seen literally hundreds of lives transformed by the opportunities provided in certification. And there's no industry like IT where you can get in with very little language and art skill and macroeconomic skill, and you can do exactly what you know and get away with it. That's what makes IT very unique. Woo! I gotta step off my soapbox. That's my answer to question number one. Don't worry, the rest of these questions won't take that long, but I do want to tack on one more thing to what I just said. Almost always as I'm having that discussion, someone will chime in and say, yes, but experience is king. And I, I fully agree. If you've got 20 years of experience, you not only gain the, the practical knowledge, but you also gain the relationships that will open doors all over the place. And no one cares what certifications or degrees you have at that point. What I'm talking about is how you get there. Or if you're bored in one of the technologies that you're doing, how do you get started into something new? That's where those tracks can help you out. Okay, the rest of the questions. What is the difference between ICND-1 and the composite exam? This question usually comes after somebody has done a little research and finds out they can get the CCNA routing and switching by taking either the ICND-1 and ICND-2 exams that you can see right here, or you can take the composite exam, as it's called, 200-125, which achieves the CCNA in one fell swoop. <laughs> you and I being efficient people are like, well, I want to go that route, right? Well, the composite exam is designed for people that are already in the industry and have experience uh, to get certification to match their experience, right? It's much, uh, much more, I'll say difficult, but it's not that you get different questions. It's the same questions as ICND-1 and ICND-2. It's just the clock is much more of an enemy in the composite exam than it is on the two exams, the ICND-1 plus two. I would highly suggest going the two exam route if you are new getting into it. Um, also, a follow-up question. Some people say, Do, does the composite exam get me both certifications, CCENT and CCNA? Uh, uh, no, it does not. It just gets you the CCNA, but no one will care at that point because you have the higher level certification anyway. Um, another question, when you take ICND-2, does the CCENT merge into and become the CCNA? Uh, no, it does not. You actually keep both unique certifications. Uh, what can I talk about on an exam? Ooh, this is a big one. Be very careful with this one, right? So here's the scenario. You go to take the exam, you pass, you come back, what do you do? You're like, friends, family, I pass, I'm excited. Study groups, online forums, I passed, I'm excited. What's the next question that's asked? Everybody wants to know, especially online, because they're studying right alongside you. How was it? Whoa, was it difficult? Did you find it easy? W what was the passing score? Now we're getting into the touchy subjects, right? What kind of questions did they have? What, what Did you feel like there was a focus on one topic versus another? Eh. You're now into the non-disclosure territory. Cisco does enforce non-disclosure. If they find you and they write in the agreement, they will say whether it was accidental, careless, or purposeful, the result is the same. They will strip your certification from you and they will keep you from testing in the future. Yikes, you don't wanna go down that road. Tell people, yes, it was hard. Whew, I felt, you know, I felt like there was a, you know, a focus in one area, but man, it, it was, it, don't say what area it was, just it was tough, it was good, I'm glad I passed, move on. Next question, do I need experience for CCNP? Meaning, as I start moving from CCNA into CCNP into CCA, do I have to have experience? Like, do I have to get a job? Do I have to set up a lab? I will say, as you get into the more advanced certification, you will see it turn into a lot more practical exam. Meaning, when you get to the CCIE level, you're literally flying out and doing this in front of Cisco, building one of the most complex networks you would ever dream of right in front of their eyes, right? So CCNP is still in the certification room you don't have to have practical experience, but it would benefit you a lot. And you can get practical experience without getting a job in the Cisco career. You can build your own lab. I'll talk about that in a whole nother nugget dedicated to building a lab environment. 
Should I just get Cisco or should I get other certifications as well? Uh, it depends. It depends on what your focus is going to be. There is careers in just networking, but usually you'll start in a career where you do a little of everything. So getting you know a CCNA uh, to get started and maybe a little Microsoft certification over here, maybe some office certification. I mean, if you can become a generalist to begin with and then focus in and grow into an area of specialty, that's usually the way to go. So when you're just getting starter, started, other certs are great. Great. But once you've started to get a mastery, then just focus on Cisco alone unless you want to. How does CCNA look to an employer? It looks good. It looks really good. It sets your resume apart from a flurry of resumes that the employer gets anytime they put a job posting out there. Um, but one thing it does do, and this is good for you and, and bad for you, I, I would say more good than bad, um, the employer immediately knows you're going to ask for a higher salary than someone without it, or at least that's assumed that you will do that. So you may not get a call from an employer who would typically offer a lower rate of pay than somebody else. So if you really want a job, maybe you want to work in an educational uh, district, even though you know that the, that the pay may not be as high as working in a private sector or something like that, then, then make them aware of that uh, in the cover letter that you put on your resume, right? Um, what position should I get into with a CCNA? Ooh, there are so many possibilities with this one, but keep in mind, CCNA is a door opener. It opens positions to you that you may not have even been considered for before, but a lot of times they will be get your foot in the door and then grow in that organization. It's like you might be an installer for a consulting firm where you have the CCIE level engineers writing the configurations for all these devices. You take them, you implement them, and you go install these networks and button up all the things that don't quite work, you know, quite right, and you gain just a ton of experience doing that. Or maybe you uh, step in as the junior network engineer at a uh, school district where you go around to to different schools and implement uh, content filtering at their firewalls and, and change, you know, VLAN assignments. I, oh, it's, it's the, the, the landscape is wide open. It's a door opener that gives you the experience you need to say, I would like to assist. That's really where the associate level comes in, right? I would like to assist in maintaining this, or I have some other experience uh, in maybe server administration, and I need to also be able to support the network. So that's where I'll add the CCNA there. That is the core of the certification questions that I get. And there are hundreds of other questions that could be asked and should be asked as you get into this. But I hope this gives you a foundation that you can build on and get all the answers that you need through your research as you continue on through this series. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.